So as we were progressing through the I Believe series, previously Pastor Fred had talked about the Father and then the Son. And now this week we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And this whole series is based on the Apostles' Creed. But you know, it's hard, it's hard to really talk about the Holy Spirit without also talking about the Father and the Son. Or, as we know all three, the Trinity. The Trinity is a concept to us that is really hard to wrap our heads around. But we're going to try to walk through that a little bit. We have this one essence that we know as God. But this one essence is also three distinct persons. And although they are all God, the Father is not the Son, nor the Holy Spirit. And the Son is not the Father, nor the Holy Spirit. And similarly, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, nor the Son. So how does this all work? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, we don't know. This is one of those mysteries of God that we just don't know. Hopefully we will know at some point, but not now. But we do have hints in Scripture about each one of these persons of the Trinity or this one essence of God. Yet we still wrestle with the thought that they are all one and yet different. Now we could reflect on the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, the Lord is one, sorry. To the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The question here is, why was Moses inspired to make that statement in Scripture? The Lord is one. Well, the answer may be that the most prominent or one of the most prominent words, Hebrew words used for God is Elohim. Now, we can head down the path of recognizing that approximately 2,500 times in the Old Testament, this name is used or a derivative of it, and it's plural. It's not one singular, it's plural. Now the most common translation of Elohim and its derivatives is just the word God in our English translation. The one essence that is shared in the Shema, this most sacred statement to the Hebrew people. So although the word Trinity never appears In Scripture, it does definitely exist. So let's quote from the Augsburg Confession. There is one divine essence, which is called and which is truly God, and there are three persons in this one divine essence, equal in power and alike eternal, God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. All three are one divine essence, eternal, without division, without end, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness. One creator and preserver of all things visible and invisible. I'm sure you've all memorized this from the Augsburg Confession, but I thought I would review it anyway. But now let's just turn our focus a little bit onto the Holy Spirit. So all three persons have similar activities ascribed to them. Like each has the work of creation. Each has the act of sanctification. However, in the book of Acts, the revelation of the truth and grace of God to man and the conversion of man to a new life is attributed to 
through the Holy Spirit. And in that new life, we gain a presence, a persevering, saving faith, an an enabling belief, strength to resist the flesh, and produce fruits of faith and love for Christ's sake. Now, John shares with us in chapter 3 where where Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So let's go back to our Old Testament reading, Joel 28. God promises to pour out His Spirit on us. And I want you to notice It doesn't just say spirit here, but rather it says, I pour out my spirit on all people. Now, something that is is the very essence of God is being poured out on the people. Not something that he made additionally after our creation, but his very essence. And further, there's no distinction of who would receive this Holy Spirit. Because he says, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters, old men and young men, even the male and female servants. The Holy Spirit is poured out for all, just as Christ's blood was poured out for all. The saving grace of what Jesus did for us can only be recognized through the efforts of the Holy Spirit working within us. And although it was very hurtful for the disciples in our Gospel reading, Jesus was adamant that He needed to leave this world in order to send the Helper. Essentially, what Jesus was saying there is, If I do not die and leave this life, nothing is gained. Mankind will remain under the curse of the law. That's essentially what he says here. This helper, this spirit of truth, will guide us into all the truth we need to move forward. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And for the believer, this is huge. The Holy Spirit opens our heart and mind to what the Father has given the Son and in turn shares with us salvation. The salvation won by us by Jesus Christ. Entering into the world, taking on our sin, dying and defeating death in His resurrection. That's the truth revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. We are transformed by the revelation and ability to believe by the work of this Helper. The Holy Spirit has another function, though, as we read another activity that he performs. He convicts the unbelieving world. For those who can't accept that Jesus has won the victory for us without any assistance on our part, the Spirit works to convict the unbelieving heart. In effect here, the Holy Spirit is really the preacher of the triune God. He is the word we hear and through it leads us into all truth so that we have faith in the truth of the word. So that we have faith in the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. But he also does something else for us. He fights for us against all the lies and deceit of the devil and is the conqueror in all tribulations. He's there with you all the time. 
Now, for me personally, the Holy Spirit has worked wonders in my life. I can point to a woman sitting there that can tell you that. (laughs) If you knew me 30 plus years ago, you would never suspect that I would be up here talking to you right now or sharing the word in any, any way, shape, or form. Not only was I uncomfortable speaking in public in front of people, I was holding on to so much baggage, I couldn't move forward. I couldn't let it go. But the Spirit helped me through that. I can attest to the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. The Spirit could have done many things with me, but for some reason, He thought it was a good idea for me to speak to you. I can't get over that decision yet either. I'm shocked. But you know that in your lives, the Spirit has worked in you as well. You know those moments in your life where you were certain that the Holy Spirit has been at work and moved you to do great things because of the faith you have in Jesus Christ. Now, I thought it would be appropriate to share with you a moment from the quake event that that our young people went to in January, because I think this is very fitting about talking about the Holy Spirit. So Suresh and I took some of our young people down to Baltimore to this quake event, and I'll tell you, we were overjoyed at how receptive they were to the message they were hearing and how they interacted with the kids from the other end other uh, congregations. They got to see many young believers just like themselves. That they're not isolated, that there are others. And they really enjoyed that event. Matter of fact, they all said, yes, let's do it again. But on the closing night, I was manning one of the prayer stations to give young people a chance to come back and join in prayer if they felt a need to actually pray with someone. Now, when you volunteer for something like that, you just never know what you're going to run into, what you're going to hear. So, you know, there's a little bit of apprehension there. But the Spirit's there to help. So as I sat there, some of the young people started to come back to the back of the room where these prayer stations were. And this young teen girl comes to me. She's probably 13 or 14 years old. And her name is Danielle. And as she approached, I could see tears running down her cheeks. Talk about apprehension. Well, we talked. We sat down. I held her hands. And she just started praying. Fervently praying that she would never turn away from Jesus Christ. I have to tell you, I was kind of shocked by that. Now, you might sit there and say, well, this was just an emotional teenager reacting to this, this event, getting all fired up, but that's not what I saw. I saw something much deeper. I saw the Spirit at work there in her. She clearly was aware of all the dangers around her, of all the lies that the world is trying to tell her. And she's looking for reassurance that the lies would not overcome her. When she finished praying, I prayed for her as well, sharing the good news that we have the glory of God with us. That God has revealed Jesus Christ and what He has done for us through the Holy Spirit and how we've been renewed through our baptism. I know when I keep looking back at that event, I'm not only struck by her wisdom and what she was asking for, but it also started me thinking about things. And I ended up asking myself some questions. First of all, Do I truly recognize the evil evil that is all around me? 
or all around us? Do I really understand all of these divisive things coming together that are attacking us? My second thought is, will I ever really understand the depth of God's glory here and the love that is shared with us in the word of Scripture and through the working of the Holy Spirit? I don't think any of us could possibly understand it here on earth, but I pray we're really going to know it when we get there, when we get to see him face to face. So my prayer for you, and really my prayer for all people, is that we would be constantly on guard and pray with such vigor to know that we are held in the secure arms of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, just as Danielle did that evening. In the name of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.